In today's modern age, it's hard to believe that a staggering 65% of our planet remains unexplored. The Earth has been known to keep its secrets for millennia, releasing them only to the most inquisitive of its inhabitants. One of the most unique, bizarre, and little-known discoveries of the last few hundred years was first described in 1941 by a Swedish explorer who almost literally stumbled upon it. In an effort to escape a Japanese prisoner of war camp, Einar Pedersen found himself shipwrecked on the island of Haidu Daifi, seemingly isolated in the South Seas. As it turned out, though, this was only one of many islands in what would come to be known by Westerners as the Haiyi Archipelago. But more astounding than the chain of islands were its previously undiscovered inhabitants, primitive forms of insects, six-winged dragonflies, and most bizarre of all, a complex and diverse group of a shrew-like order of mammals called Rhinogradentia, Latin for nosewalkers. These little creatures use their heavily modified noses, called nasarium, to do everything from walking to jumping to digging to steering flight. In order to study these creatures, known colloquially as snouters, a center for study was established on Haiyi, called the Darwin Institute of Haiyi. In 1957, the museum's curator, a German man named Harold Stumke, published a thorough and comprehensive account of each of the island species of snouters. Translated into English, this work is known as The Snouters, Form and Life of the Rhinograds. Sadly, it is the only detailed account of this entire order. In the late 1950s, a secret nuclear weapons test conducted by the U.S. military in the Pacific Ocean inadvertently triggered a massive earthquake, which in turn caused each of the Haiyi Islands to sink into the ocean. In just a few short hours, all of the new and diverse life on those planets was completely obliterated. To make things even worse, all living rhinogridologists, including Harold Stumke himself, were attending a conference on the islands at the time. In effect, this single event completely wiped out all traces of the snouters and their study. All, that is, except for Stumke's single manuscript, which had been mailed to his illustrator. Of course, this loss of an entire field of scientific study would be much more tragic, if any of it were actually true. In reality, the islands, the rhinograds, and even Harold Stumke himself were all invented by a German zoologist named Gerolf Steiner. Apart from being a professor at a distinguished university in Germany, Steiner had a love for illustration. Around 1945, he drew his first snouter as a thanks to one of his students, and the rest is, well, fiction. His original drawing was inspired by a poem by Christian Morgenstern, dating back to 1894. Behold the prideful walk on nose, the nasal beam with nasal toes. Behold also his handsome pup. Tis true you cannot look him up. He figures not in mayor or brame. No reference work contains his name. In this my song he makes his bow, to all of you, and that is how. At last you can, complete with pup, as I have mentioned farther up. Behold the prideful walk on nose, the nasal beam with nasal toes. As his alter ego, Harold Stumke, Steiner theorized that the poem's author must have been one of the first to document the existence of a snouter. In reading the snouters, form and life of the rhinograds, it's pretty clear that Steiner was familiar with the zoological conventions of the 1950s. Despite its whimsical subjects, his book covers extensive taxonomies, nomenclatures, field notes, developmental biology, and even dissection of nearly 200 of these fictional critters, written in a dry and academic tone. Each species of rhinogradentia possesses a very unique structure called a nasarium, which is a kind of modified snout or nose. But for most of those species, it's far more than a simple appendage. It's filled with nerves and specialized muscles, and its main tissue is corpus spongiosium, which can be soft or rigid depending on blood pressure. Almost all species use their nasarium as a form of locomotion, with one of the notable exceptions being the primitive snouter. As a result, the front limbs are often used exclusively for grasping, and in many species, the rear limbs are merely vestigial or even absent altogether. Stumke theorized that all living rhinograds descended from a primitive ancestor, much like the primitive snouter itself, which still uses its legs to walk, though it does use its nasarium to support it while it eats. From there, rhinogradentia is divided into two main groups, monorhina, which have a single, usually very specialized nasarium, and polyrhina, which have multiple nasaria. The species themselves are incredibly diverse, taking up ecological niches that might otherwise have been filled by predatory and herbivorous mammals, reptiles, birds, even worms and fish. The armor-tailed slime snouter, for example, has a slug-like nasarium, which ripples on a layer of slime that moves it forward very slowly. Its front legs are then used for grasping and digging for food. Other species use the organ to catch food. The snuffling sniffler, for example, lives along streams and brooks, and by expelling long, fine threads from its nasarium down into the water, it can trap small insects and fish. It then retracts these sticky threads, consuming its prey with a long tongue, and at the end of its long tail, it has a venomous claw, which it uses for defense. 
In the water, you might find the trumpet snouter, which lives its life suspended in ponds and lakes from something called a nasal siphon. Shaped like a funnel and fringed by water-repellent hair, this nasarium acts like a buoy, allowing the trumpet snouter to trap plankton with the bristles that line its sides, feeding off of them with a long proboscis-like mouth. But not all of the snouters belonging to the group Monorhina have nasaria that are fleshy or buoyant. The golden snout leaper, for example, has a nasarium supported by two bones called the nasar and nasibia. This adaptation allows them to leap backwards at a decent distance. The front limbs, no longer needed for locomotion, are used to grasp food while the rear legs have disappeared entirely. A close relative of the golden snout leaper has even developed the ability to fly. The ear wing possesses long, slender, bone-supported ears that act as wings. The nasarium is forked at the end, allowing it to act as both a steering rudder while airborne, as well as to assist in landing. Stumke's description of the ear wing is worth reading, so here it is. Especially peculiar and characteristic is the takeoff and landing of the ear wings. The animal, standing on its flexed snout, first cocks its ears, i.e. raises them vertically so that they touch one another, then flexes the dudonasal joint even more strongly, as in hopsorhinus, after which the several phases ensue, as in the latter, with the difference that the leap is more vertical. Shortly before the jump reaches its peak height, its ears are powerfully depressed. The fully extended snout is spread wide in the autonasal region, and the animal flies. These individual phases can, of course, be analyzed only by high-speed photography. Biologically speaking, the polyrhina group is especially interesting. During embryonic development, the nasarium clefts and divides into four or six independent nasaria, each with its own muscles and nostrils. The best example described in Stumke's book is the nasobema lyricum, which moves on a four-pronged nasarium. Interestingly, the nasarium's rigidity isn't due to bones, but a kind of pneumatic system using air pressure from the animal's sinuses. This means that they can collapse and strengthen their nasaria almost instantly, making lyricum fast and agile. It also means that they constantly emit a hissing sound as they move. Like some other rhinograids, their rear limbs are vestigial, with their front legs and tail fully prehensile. There are many, many more species described in this book, more than can be described here. If you're curious, I definitely recommend reading the text, which I'll leave a link to in the description. At the time of its publication, the Snouters was extremely popular, and by 2000 had been translated into English, French, Italian, Japanese, and Russian. Now it lives on as one of the best-known biological hoaxes and scientific jokes of all time. It's been referenced by numerous publications, some taking great pleasure at being in on the joke. In 1963, for example, renowned paleontologist G.G. G. Simpson wrote a review of Steiner's work for the Science Journal, as though it were a completely legitimate record. On April Fool's Day in 2012, the National Museum of Natural History in France claimed to have discovered a previously unknown genus of rhinograde called nasoperforator, which is able to drill into wood with an enamel-covered nasarium by rotating their body. On the surface, the snouters may just seem like another elaborate joke. And, well, that's exactly what it was. But as Joe Kane of the University College of London points out, it's much more than that. Gerald Steiner's joke captured imaginations. It provided education by spoofing and became what Atlas Obscura called zoology's favorite hoax. It gave birth to a kind of inside joke within the scientific community, which crossed cultural, national, and language barriers to connect people who might never have otherwise interacted. But even more than that, maybe the concept of speculative zoology can also serve to open our eyes to the amazing world around us. Rodents that walk on their noses may not exist, but have you ever seen the platypus? Works of fiction like Steiner's remind us that we're all surrounded by stunning biodiversity, and the Earth still holds secrets just waiting to be discovered. As G.K. Chesterton once said, Fairy tales say that apples were golden, only to refresh the forgotten moment when we found out they were green. They make rivers run with wine only to make us remember, for one wild moment, that they run with water.